there is a place just out of reach where we go to escape an enchanted land of far away nearby. Out in the far away nearby, can you hear my call? Out in the far away nearby, I'm breaking down the wall, still you are here to stay. Out from the far away. Hello, and welcome to the far away nearby. I am DJ Star Sage, and this is episode 24, a Saturday morning experience. Today, I am joined as always by the Duchess Sue. Hi, Sue, how are you? Hi, DJ. I'm doing real well. And yourself? I'm doing quite well. And we are. And today we have the pleasure of the company of a good friend from abroad, Mr. Paul Chandler of The Shy Life. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> that was Big Ben. That's, just the, that's, <laughs> our, that's our big clock in London. <laughs> Oh, right. Yes. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself? Yeah, good. Thanks. Good to good to be here. It's good to have you back with us, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> yes, we uh, we uh, last touched base with each other before the holidays, and I understand you've been quite busy. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, mainly with, mainly with the podcast, uh, recording new episodes often in advance. So. Uh, yeah, that's what I do with my free time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure every one of us can remember what it was like to be a child. A much simpler time when mom made your lunch, cut the crusts off your bread, and your greatest worry was catching. So we're going to explore some of the best memories of childhood. Saturday morning. Before we begin, here's a brief history on the subject. The first television broadcast took place atop the Empire State Building in 1936, three years before World War II. It wasn't until almost a decade later when the first programs for children began to appear. One of the first was Chicago's Junior Jamboree, later renamed Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, was an unscripted and ad-libbed puppet show that would inspire the later likes of Punch and Judy and Waylon and Madam. In the United States, early children's television was often a marketing branch of a larger corporate product, such as Disney, and it rarely contained any educational elements. For instance, The Magic Clown, a popular early children's program, was primarily an advertisement for Bonomo's <coughs> Turkish Taffy product. This practice continued, albeit in a much toned-down manner, through the 1980s in the United States, when the Federal Communications Commission prohibited tie-in advertising on broadcast television. So, Paul, paint us a picture. Take us back to the childhood of a young Yeti. Tell us, was mom making your pancakes or waffles? And what was on your television? And what had you taken out of your toy chest? Well, um, from what I can re- remember, really, uh, it was things like sort of, um, for food-wise, other than cereals, it would be things like uh, like a, a bacon and egg sandwich, for instance. Uh, I was always partial to, to something like that with some tomato ketchup. Um, and... Um, I, one thing I, I will say, my, my childhood, kind of came, as far as Saturday mornings were concerned, was interrupted from about the age of 11 to 13 by the fact that I went to a school for two years, which uh, actually meant that I had to be in school on a Saturday morning. But um, luckily, up until the age of 11, and then from uh, 13 onwards, things were back to normal, and I was able to um, enjoy my Saturday morning. <laughs> it, it was no fun, absolutely no fun, having to go to school on a Saturday morning. I went to a, a boarding school for those two years, although I didn't actually board. And um, so I think that's why there was classes on a Saturday morning. It was just to kind of, uh, because the, key, the, the kids needed to be kept busy, I suppose. But um, yeah. but uh, as far as, as sort of what I was what I was watching, there were, particularly sort of in the late 70s or early 80s, there were often shows on our two main channels that would uh, run in par- parallel. So, for instance, there was one on, on the BBC called Multicoloured Swap Shop, 
Uh, and um, <laughs> the, 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 the swap shop, literally one of the main things of swap shop was that people rung in and um, they would have things, the kids would have things that they wanted to sell. And it was like an early version of eBay. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think people would, would, would be ringing in saying, oh, yes, I want that, but I'll swap it for this. And yeah. um, there was also an element of op- um, outdoor broadcast where um, one, of the, one of the hosts would be there with loads of kids and, um, and, and they'd be doing swap, swapping and things. But there was also a show called Tis Was on the other side. Uh, now, uh, Tis was uh, well. I mean, both shows uh, sort of had a mixture of, of, of cartoons and guests, and Tis was was the slightly more madcap of the two. Um, that there was a character called the Phantom Flanflinger, um, who would be just sort of covered in a sort of like hooded, so you couldn't see who he was. And he had like a custard pie. And so, um, you know, sometimes the guests would get, um, would, would, would find a flan in their face. <laughs> and um, it, it was a lot, so it was a lot messier a show. And um, the, the main host of that was a guy called Chris Tarrant, who later went on to be the main host of the um oh the, the millionaire game um, who wants to be a millionaire um over in the uk so uh he went on to slightly less messy things uh, but, um, <laughs> i think what a lot of kids do uh, sorry what a lot of kids did i think with 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 those two shows and also there were other shows that, that, that sort of replaced those is that they you'd watch a bit of one and then when you got bored or there was a, a guest you weren't interested in, you flick over to the other channel and watch a bit of that until something came up you you didn't want. And then you flick back in and see what was going on. I don't know if people literally sat and watched one um, sort of from beginning to end. They, I, well, certainly I, I jumped from channel to channel. <laughs> but um, as far as games are concerned, I always... Well, I was very keen on my teddy bears and they all had names and they all had uh, um, but I think a lot of my games were sort of in my head like playing Doctor Who um, and sort of and, and I quite happily go off into the countryside and play Doctor Who whether I got friends with me or not because I just imagined the other characters were there as well um, but I was very much into sort of stories with cliffhangers and, and then I'd do the recap of the cl- of the cliffhanger I'd just done, and, and so you know, you, I, I can see how I've gone from doing that to what I do today on, um, <laughs> now, with, on my podcast. And things. Did, did your friends know enough about Doctor Who that you could uh, have them pick which companion they were going to be? Yeah, pre- pretty much, because it was still kind of really popular back in the in the sort of late seventies, early eighties. Although it was around the time that. Um, probably about 83 when it was the 20th anniversary there was a story where more than one doctor all the five doctors were together so i think after that it wasn't so much of a case of i'm the doctor you're the companion it was oh i'm the fifth doctor you're the fourth doctor you're... <laughs> and most of my friends were girls but they were tomboys so they didn't want to be a girl companion they wanted to be the doctor as well so um so so yeah i think after about 83 it became People realise they didn't. Have, they could. They could. Everyone could be the doctor. There's, there's enough, enough to go around for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, I, I have to make a confession. I did go to school on Saturdays sometimes, but it was for a completely different reason. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I ask what that reason was. Well, uh, there was a time or two that I had to take summer school, but um, mm. th- that was that was due to performance in math class, not for um, you know being a prankster in school. But <laughs> well, that sounds uh-huh. that sounds eerily familiar. I think I went to school one summer for that same reason. <laughs> oh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, birds of a feather. So, uh, so um, oh, uh, D- uh, DJ, we've mm-hmm. got. Uh, some um, 
So some, uh, Toppy's written something in the uh, chat room. Would you like me to? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So for those yes, of you uh, listening, I, we have appointed Paul as our ambassador to the chat room. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, oh, that's helpful. Toppy, Toppy says, um, we've had versions of Swap Shop here in the USA, but it's always been on the radio. He's never seen it done on TV. So. Yeah, I um, so I that's... grew up not far from Toppy's area, and I remember some of those shows. We had one that was called mm-hmm. Tradio, and it was basically uh-huh. like a, um, a garage sale or a yard sale that you advertised on the radio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, here in the Midwest, we uh, sell football tickets through a program su- such as that. Um. I'm we sure. have very important football tickets to your football team here that needs to, to to that people like to watch. Um, I, I'm surprised it hasn't made some sort of resurgence more recently. Uh, certainly in the UK, it sounds like I suppose everything's on the internet. You don't need it on the on the radio and TV so much. But mm-hmm. so, Paul, I, I think, uh, my husband I think is. They'll have the 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 thing where people are trying to buy football tickets and and they dogs and and lost dogs and stuff Mm -hmm. so paul my husband is a little bit of an anglophile and he grew up watching doctor who on pbs years before i started i um i do enjoy it but i have to confess i didn't get turned on to doctor who until star trek was off the air Uh, and i don't mean the original star trek of course i meant there was no Thank more you. new Star Trek being produced on current TV. Yes. So I, yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, kind of like, uh, what books haven't I read yet? Oh, wait, there's all these years of Doctor Who. Okay, it, that doesn't look <laughs> yeah. bad. My uncle used to watch it. So, But uh, anyways, uh, on that note, my husband's asked me to ask you uh, of a huh? few shows he saw uh, online that were popular 80s shows in the UK. So... Um, if you would like to type out into the chat room or everyone in the chat room, there's a website, everything eighties UK. And it's, I think it's everything 80. I have it in our show notes, everything eighties dot co dot UK. I do believe, but, um, Billy asked about shows like the Thunderbirds, Terra Hawks, Mm -hmm. Banana Man, Danger Mouse. And there's a few others, um, Super Ted, Around the World with Willie Fogg, and Jamie and the Magic Torch. Do any of those ring a bell? Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't know. Because as well as Saturday morning TV, we, we also have, we, we don't, I don't think we do anymore, but in my day, we used to have kids TV every day of the week from about half three till six o'clock. And a lot of those shows, I would say, would have been the ones that would have been um, in, in that show at that time. Um, Thunderbirds obviously dates back to the 60s uh, as w- but it was always it, it, it would always kind of resurge and, and it would be repeated again um, Terra Hawks was definitely 80s I was actually recently thinking I wouldn't mind uh, getting the DVDs and seeing that again because I only sort of half remember it but I'm sort of in- interested in um, you know just uh, it, it's quite an interesting interesting show. I want to that was the yeah, idea that definitely sort of was in my era as was danger mouse well i've got some dvds of danger mouse um super ted has a doctor who connection because one of the characters was played by john pertwee um, and again that was that was a cartoon around the world with willie fogg i definitely remember um and jamie and the magic torch was uh definitely that was sort of 70s that was um that was sort of also something I remember growing up, growing up with. So yeah, I I, I do remember all, all of those uh, at one stage or another. And of course, because my brother is eight and a half years younger than me, I, in a way we sort of overlap. So there were certain shows that I didn't really watch, but I remember him watching. Or by the time he was growing up, he had videos. So things like Thundercats I, there isn't really my era. But I remember it very well because he was watching it and he loved Thundercats. Now, um, you were saying that one of those shows was one that John Pertwee had been on? Yeah, Super Ted. He did a voice. Oh, okay. Because um, I, I was going to say, because I know that he also did a, a live action series, but um, that wasn't on Billy's list. Uh, 
for those of you who aren't familiar, John Pertwee, who played the third Doctor in Doctor Who, uh, in the first Color episodes, he was in a series from 79 to 81 called Wurzel Gummidge, where he played a scarecrow. That's right, and they're based on books as well. Um, and, um, yeah, he, I think he, along with Doctor Who, I think Wurzel Gummidge was a very, very close to his heart. Um, and uh, it, it's a series I've rewatched, and, you know, in my adult uh, life and uh, I think it, it, I find some of the some of it is, is actually more um, affecting now than it might have been as a kid because it was a gummage he's very uh, he's very, very in, an innocent and sometimes he encounters characters who really are horrible to him or make them believe that or that, 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 that they love him say and he falls for it and and it's actually quite heartbreaking watching it now in a way that I perhaps didn't even notice when I was a kid um, I, I've got there's quite a lot um, here from Toppy. Would you like me to? Oh sure. Would you like me to yeah. fill us in on um, what's going on in the there, chat room, sir? There are paragraphs. There are paragraphs. Right? <laughs> 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 and I, I, didn't, I don't want him to go, go past without me. Uh, so this is some of Toppy's experiences. Uh, he says, "Here is my ch- here is my cherished Saturday morning memories. My brother and I would wake up at five a five a.m. and quietly go downstairs and fix ourselves a bowl of cereal." which we would take into the living room and we would sit cross-legged on the wood floor in front of the black and white TV and the only thing that would be on uh, and and the only thing that would be on was one of the local channels. Um, then he says, oh, he, he says, yes, the, the, the local channels were playing uh, obscure Western movies like an early John Wayne or something. Uh, then the cartoons would start, would start at 7 a.m., and that it was all cartoons until the monster movie matinee, which would start about 1 p.m. That was his favourite. It was hosted by two guys who were in costume. One is Dracula. You would only see his hand. And his assistant, Igor. They would chat and introduce the movie, uh, which would be some old monster movie. Um, And then he says, uh, here is the... Here's the end of my era of Saturday morning cartoons. It was when one of the networks aired a half hour live action show called Captain Marvel. Then it was followed by Mighty Isis, whatever year that was, probably 1976 or so. That marks the last year that he sat around on Saturday mornings watching cartoons. But um, he, he has also put in a note here to ask DJ to describe Banana Man. I, I, I can do. I don't know. Have you seen Banana Man, DJ, I'd, or was that better if I try and explain it? It'd be better if you tried. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's quite because I'm sure there are bits I'm miss, missing. But basically, it was a a guy who he was. It was a cartoon, and he or I can't. I think the guy was a bit of a a flop, and you know, not a very not a very heroic character. And then some something made him be a superhero called Banana Man. And I would have to, I'd have to get the inf- more information. I, I'll see if I can do, I'll see if I can do that whilst we're talking so I can give you a bit better. A better. <laughs> um, I mean, Super Ted was something similar. That was to do with toys who, again, a cartoon toys that were bestowed, uh, were, were bestowed some magical powers by some passing aliens or something. Um, um, so, so yeah, it was all, and, and, and both series were voiced by sort of relatively well-known British actors, uh, hence John Pertwee's involvement. I'm just, I'm just getting up, trying to get up a bit more information on Banana Man because the actual, um, the actual details. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, Banana Man is a parody of traditional superheroes being portrayed as a schoolboy who is transformed into a muscled, caped figure when he eats a banana. The character originally pe- appeared um, in uh, like one of our comics, um, children's comics, in about 1980. And mm. the... Uh, the no, it doesn't, doesn't say quite what era. Uh, uh, the TV cell here... The TV series was between 1983 and 1986. And, um, yeah. Uh, hmm. 
I think there's so, some association with Jim Henson as well. Mm-hmm. So, Sue, you didn't grow up with a television, but you're a proud grandmother. What sort of things would the Grand Duchesses be up to on a Saturday morning, and what kind of TV shows and toys? Well, yes, the uh, Grand Youngins were very fond of all the PBS children's programming because their mother sort of insisted, from Sesame Seat to the Teletubbies which had a small controversy with some of our religious people in this country. Uh, but they especially liked the, a program called the Bananas in Pajamas. Oh, and here we go. And one Christmas, the Duke and I purchased life-size dolls of the bananas thinking that the girls would love them. Mm-hmm. The dolls got stuck in the corner. Oh. And they didn't really play with them much. But the pajamas promptly came off of them, and the girls wore them. And they wore them as long as they could get any part of a digit uh, or an appendage into them. They just <laughs> they, they really loved the bananas and pajamas. That's a very cute series. About They're very nice. They're uh, you know, there, there seemed to be no adult people around that area, but um, there the children are all, or whatever, are all appropriate. There, the two bananas and the uh, the family of bears next door, and I, I can't remember many other characters. They were those were there were those five were mostly there were three of the bears and and the two bananas. Mm-hmm. And uh, they also, uh, because of their um, parental, uh, because of their parents, they were exposed at a very early age to horror movies, mm-hmm. uh, which <laughs> rather horrified me. <laughs> I, oh. I did not necessarily think it was appropriate when four and five year olds were watching things where they were shooting people and melting snowmen in the back of the truck with antifreeze because it wouldn't die. And, and I, I don't know why. So I, I don't like horror movies and I've seen bits and pieces of some of this stuff. And I'm just going, this is not good for small people. I just know it's not, but I guess it hasn't really hurt them. They, no, not, although they still like horror movies and right. books no, like not, that. that they're okay. No, <laughs> not not to peel back the curtain too much on Mama Bear's family, but was that a home life situation where both parents were working different times, or? Um, frequently, Mama Bear and her first husband, only one of them would work at a time. Okay, I was I was asking because um, my sister Betty was in a situation like that where she and her husband worked factory jobs and they were opposite shifts. And Mm -hmm. they were lucky that their neighbors didn't have a uh, keener interest in their home because my nephews were often left with the TV as the babysitter. Yeah. So, okay. Well, no, my, my, my grandbabies were not like, were not left alone. They, but that did not necessarily mean that their television habits uh, were, were any more appropriate. (laughs) I mean, they were, because they were, they were uh, exposed to all sorts of very strange things because their uh, father especially was uh, prone to watching those things when Uh, the girls were there. And as they say, that's another story. (laughs) Yes. Sorry, sorry. We, we, we have, uh, we have another entrance, uh, entrance into the chat room. Yay. <laughs> and, and Toppy is also says um, it seems that every generation has some show with bananas in the title. Um, <laughs> now, 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 now for him, now, now and he makes a he he makes a typo and he realizes it. But I'll read you what he wrote. Um, for me, it was circa it was circa nineteen seventeen, and then he says nineteen seventeen. No, I'm in nineteen seventy one. I'm not that old. I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> He, he says the banana show that he remembers is the banana splits. And we had the banana splits over, shown over here as well. Um, 
So I remember, I sort of remember them as well, probably from maybe later in the 70s, because I wasn't alive in 1971. But, uh, and um, George, who is also in the chat room, has wandered into the chat room, mm. references an 80s uh, thing called banana. Banana or ram? Banana, banana or rama, but I think they were they're Whatever, a, popular, so not a TV show, so. <laughs> um, but still, banana, banana, anyway. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> so I grew up with a stay-at-home father, and some of my earliest and most fond memories are of watching PBS and shows like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers with my dad. But some of my other favorites were things like the Smurfs. <laughs> I also enjoyed cartoons like The Gummy Bears, which, coming to find out, was voiced by some of the people that did Rocky and Bullwinkle. And uh, I enjoyed She-Ra. Uh, a lot of people liked He-Man, but for obvious reasons, I took a liking to She-Ra. I used to play with the girl down the street, and I was very jealous of all the toys she had because both her parents were working and she had nice things. Um, and then another show that was my favorite later run was a little show called Bionic Six. A family brought together by faith and given superpowers through the miracle of modern science. And I was explaining to the Duchess and Paul just a bit ago, Bionic Six was a show that came out in the 80s and... It was sort of the 80s answer to the $6 million man and the bionic woman if they had adopted kids and had a family. Um, a little bit of James Bond in there, too, because the dad was a secret agent for the government. And so he contracted an alien virus and spread it to his family. And the only way they could save the family was, of course, by turning them all bionic. So... Um, <laughs> And then came Nickelodeon. Now, Paul was already talking about messy kid shows on TV. And I have a, I have a special place for Nickelodeon. Um, after I wanted to be an astronaut, I decided I wanted to be a game show host. And uh, my dad was a very handy guy with his tools and, uh, you know, hammer and nails and everything. And when he learned that my next thing I wanted to be was a game show host, he built me my own podium. So I was able to host my own mock game shows in my basement and I would dress up as a game show host and I would write out questions for my show and play games when my friends came over. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Did any of your friends want to be the host? <laughs> Some of them did, but that's kind of like the video games that are one player. You have to decide yeah. when the other person gets to play and sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, nearest, the nearest I did to that and it wasn't really a kids game show but there was a program called Treasure Hunt which I used to like which was a lady in a in a helicopter and she was being guided around a certain area of the countryside uh, and, th and there would be clues and they'd have to kind of try and back in the studio they'd have to try and guess what the clue meant and then they'd be looking on the map and they'd say please take the helicopter it was all you know it was all quite um, sort of on location and quite grand and um, so I yeah, I didn't have a helicopter but I did a mini version of that <laughs> so I used to invite friends over and I'd do like the questions and I'd go out before they came over and put the next put the question because as you on this program as you got the question right you'd then pick up the next clue so I'd go around my village and I'd do this and I'd leave the clues for us to, to find and I did I, I did I was really keen on this TV program and um uh, yeah, I, I remember one summer I did did that quite quite a few friends. I was kind of, oh, who can I invite over this time so I can? Uh, I, I, I can't imagine what the questions were. My village was very unremarkable, and uh, um, there wasn't much to write about. But um, I've got some more things from the chat room if you're interested. Sure, go ahead. Um, George says the Smurfs were that transitional cartoon from the old and new. I wanted to make a blueberry shake with the Smurfs. Uh, 
<laughs> Toppy says, I don't honestly think that there was ever anything better when it came to Saturday morning cartoons than those classic Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny cartoons. Mm-hmm. Although he says, I couldn't stand the Roadrunner. Um, <laughs> I, I, actually, that's, that's one place. Toppy and I usually agree, but that's one, that's one uh, place that I just I, Roadrunner was one of my favourites. Um, <laughs> mine, mine as well. <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh, he, uh, he, mentioned, he also mentioned Sylvester and Tweety. Um, George, George agrees with Toppy Smelly. Um, George goes beep beep. Um, <laughs> Top, Toppy says the Smurfs, He Man, Thundercats came after his era of Saturday morning TV watching. Um, and George says it, he was much more. He remembers Bugs Bunny, Flintstones, Jetsons. That was his. That was some things he liked. Um, mm-hmm. Toppy says other cartoons from his era were the Herculoids. Johnny Quest and other Hanna Barbera productions, but whilst one thing I need to ask you, DJ mm-hmm. and, and Sue, would you say that the kids' TV was mainly just um, on Saturday, or would you have had kids' TV during the, during the, the week? Um, back in because it sounds like a lot of these shows were specifically on Saturday mornings, whereas we we, we had them spread out across the week. I think there were things during the week, especially in the morning time when mm. when small children, like yeah. under um, under kindergarten age, at least would be watching. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, mo- mostly Sesame Street and Mister Rogers during weekdays before school, yeah. or maybe or um, right, maybe just uh, in the uh, time that your siblings would be going to school, because that's something I remember is when they were, you know, on the bus going to school, I was watching, like, Sesame Street. Yeah, I, I, so I think there were some, some day children's things. And there and there was afternoon cartoons, or not necessarily cartoons, mm-hmm. but shows for for children, I think. Right, because um, um, the, the afternoon shows usually took the uh, format of a program with a message. There was usually mm-hmm. some sort of a show where, you know, they went on an adventure with mom and dad, or the kid found out why you don't walk away from your family when you're in the department store because you get lost. They were the after-school uh-huh. specials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they were also dealt with slightly older children. They weren't, they weren't like the Teletubbies, which were mm. more of a, 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 a toddler-type mm-hmm. age. We used to have a show called Grange Hill, which was all about... Um, a school, like a, a secondary school, or a sort of from the age eleven onwards, and um, I know cer- certain parents that I knew of. My parents let me watch it, but I know some parents wouldn't let the kids um, watch it because <laughs> uh, it was weird. Because such a, I don't know if it was the kids who went to private schools, so it was too much for them to cope with what might be happening in a uh, in a secondary school, which was not uh, a public school. And um, I think maybe they were, the kids were too naughty. They didn't want them to be learning bad habits or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, did now you obviously didn't go to a, to the public school. You went to a. I, I, I don't I, know what you called the, yeah, the, no, a I, normal school well, in, went, in England. I, I went to a no, I went to a normal school for all but two years. Um, I went to a private school for two years in between because there was a stage where my parents wanted me to go to a certain school mm. and I didn't pass the exam, but there was a chance to take the exam again at the age of 13. So they sent me to this private school for two years and I did pass the exam at 13 and went to the grammar school, which was the school they wanted me to go to. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it was, a, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it was a school that was good if you liked sport and, <laughs> and I and I and I I'm pretty much the same as I was then. I like reading and I like writing. And, I, and, and you know, I didn't like uh, running around on a muddy, rugby pitch. Or <laughs> <laughs> so, and now we come to the sweetest part of Saturday morning: <laughs> breakfast. I love the rich. Holy goodness, kill off many weeds. But the delicious frosted side makes the rich kid in me open wide. The nutritious shredded wheat helps keep me on my toes. But the little ballerina in me thinks the taste steals the show. So, Paul, tell us, what was your favorite thing in your cereal bowl on the plate at the breakfast table when you were a kid? 
Well, I, I always think that the cereals that we had over here are really boring compared to what you have. Because <laughs> when I've been to the States, I've seen all these different, you know, these different um, cereals we never had. But we, we did have one or two interesting ones. We had one called Ricicles. We had Frosties. Uh, we had Cocoa Pops. A lot of the other ones were very, very boring, though. Uh, I was talking to Toppy recently about, a, uh, I think it was a, an, an American uh, serial called Quisp, because it has a little alien on the front cover. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he, we were talking about the aliens that sometimes appear on my podcast. Um, <laughs> and he said that when he pitches these aliens, he pitches the alien on the front of the Quisp cereal packet. <laughs> I don't know that we had. I don't know we had Quisp, and I don't think we had Lucky Charms or any of those. I, 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 I suppose I, I lived in ignorance when I was a kid. I <laughs> didn't miss them because I didn't know they existed. But now I feel retrospectively jealous that. Uh, but, you, um, I, but you didn't sit down to a bran muffin for breakfast, right? No, Did, no I mean, Frosty, Frosties and Rice Cools. They were sort of. Uh, they were very sugar coated and cocoa pops were, mm -hmm. were, 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 where you sort of poured the milk out over them and then they'd make, make the milk chocolatey. Um, but, but as far as a lot of the other ones were much more healthy sort of bran flakes and Weetabix and not so exciting, but, uh, um, we certainly didn't have the range, um, that, that, that you did, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so when I go, when I visited, I've made sure to <laughs> try some of the ones that you that you have. You know, I, I now I don't know if they're still as popular as they once were, but there was a time where we had restaurants and or hotels where in the breakfast buffet area you would have a cereal bar, and by that you had like a buffet of different kinds of cereals you could choose from. Yeah. I'll be when I've been, yeah, when I've been on holiday, with most most hotels over here or in Europe have uh, have that sort of range, um, and uh, yeah, it's always it's always nice to try the the the, the different ones. I, I, the, the chat room seems to be commenting on on some of the cereals. Would you like me to to, to tell you what we've got? Cro Cronehaven's um, coming in, coming oh. in the chat room as well. Welcome. We're doing pretty well in the chat room today. <laughs> Um, the actually, actually, just to since we last talked, since we, I last updated the chat room, we've got another whole page worth. So oh I'll my. rattle through it quickly, if that's sure. okay. Sure. Um, now, Crone um, was talking about um, Roadrunner cartoons and how the, about the the Acme products that used to appear um, <laughs> in those, and how um, Crone, Crone says I always wanted Wiley to catch the Roadrunner. And Sylvester to catch Tweety Pie. Um, <laughs> Toppy says, good old Acme products. Um, Toppy says, in the early 70s, I recall on weekdays, most local channels would play cartoons during the 3.30 to 5 time slot. I think that's when I would see cartoon, cartoons like the Flintstones, Mad Magilla, Gorilla, the Jetsons. Um, Crone says, sugar pops are tops. George says... Whoever invented shredded wheat should be put in a wood chipper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Toppy says, even frosted shredded wheat. <laughs> even frosted shredded wheat, George. Um, and George says, especially frosted, trying to disguise that crap would be high. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> now, just to pause you for a second there, I have a cute story. When I was a kid, we lived out in the country, of course, and we were driving along on my way to my grandparents' house. And sometimes in the winter, farmers would cover their bales of, of hay and such for the animals. And so I would ask my dad what that was, because it didn't look right to me. And he said, oh, that's frosted wheat. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like it. Uh, um, G George says um, honeycombs. Um, I'm not sure is that a type of, of cereal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Toppy says I recall all the kiddie cereals like Cap Cap and Crunch and the like, and they all had one thing in common: they would shred the roof of your mouth <laughs> with bloody pop. <laughs> <laughs> See, Paul, you didn't have to have government intervention to sh stop the uh, the sugar parade. We did. Crone <laughs> <laughs> um, says, I like the little boxes of cereal. Special K was always the last one picked. 
oh yeah, I remember we have we have those variety packs, and it's always yeah. boring ones like like cornflakes. Those seem. <laughs> those we're, seem... Not, we're not going to get any sponsorship deals, are we? No that? kidding. You know, we're going to get. Like, we're going to get sponsorship deals from all the sugary cereal. <laughs> I remember the variety packs of cereal. I think my parents used to get them because, you know, you've got a house of four kids. Everyone would get something. But yeah. the last time I went to look for them, I, I didn't remember seeing them in the grocery stores anymore. Yeah, they still do them over here because when I go and see my friend Nick, uh, he's always got the, the variety pack for me. And uh, But I usually have to have two because one barely fills a bowl these days. That's right. <laughs> Well, you know, they make the box bigger and the package smaller. Yeah. Now, when you open them up, it's like five little flakes got out. <laughs> well, and we also have, in, have increased the por- our portion size. Yeah, I think my mum always says, well, if that's what they, if that's how much you're supposed to have, that's how much you're supposed to have. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, but, but, yeah but, that, but this is made for a kid. This is a kid's portion, not an adult's portion. Right. Uh, but to- uh, Toppy was say- is saying here that... Uh, uh, it was often the kiddie serials who were the main advertisers for these Saturday morning cartoons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Toppy also said, this, "Sorry, this is." But we're very busy in the chat room tonight. Yes. Um, um, Toppy asks Crone, "Did you eat those variety pack cereals by splitting the box open and pouring the milk right into the box <laughs> and then eat it out of the box?" <laughs> That's something that he enjoyed doing. <laughs> Well, yeah, they they were designed to do that. You could, yeah. uh, I think they had an opening on the front of it that you could, that you could just open the box. Yeah, I suppose technically you could because the ones we had had a plastic. The actual cereals were inside mm-hmm. the box in in a mini a mini version of what you got. I suppose we could have done, but I think we'd have just been. A, it would have been just asking for trouble. We would have had it all over the floor. So, uh, <laughs> we were always given a bowl. <laughs> uh, does that... Oh, does Crone that... says, yeah, yes, mm-hmm. that's exactly what she did. And uh, <laughs> T- Toppy is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> does that catch us up, Sir Paul? Yes. All yes, right. Now that I've promoted you in the royalty there. Um, <laughs> so, Sue, what were the best parts of breakfast when you were growing up or when your granddaughters were? Oh, um, when I was growing up, mother during the winter, mother always provided us with a hot meal for breakfast. But it was usually hot cereal, cooked cereal like oatmeal or um, cream of rice or cream of wheat. Um, and I still like those a lot. <laughs> and, I, and when I have time, I cook them. They take like five minutes. Um, but the best breakfast meals we had were reserved for supper when when they there was something that we had to do like going to basketball games or or whatever for for the older kids and that's when we would get like pancakes and and eggs and bacon and with all the fixings you know mm-hmm. uh, and and that was. That was pretty good. Now, I, I fed my baby's cold cereal, OJ, and yogurt, and Mama Bear has kept the yogurt and added frozen breakfast pizzas. Oh. So, we have had a journey through our breakfast. But, <laughs> uh, the kids do eat cereal. The babies eat, eat uh, cereal rather than the... And I think Mama Bear doesn't eat the breakfast pizzas anymore i'm not even sure they still make them hmm. since i never purchased them I, right I, I have i've had them over at her house sometimes when the girls were tiny but not hmm. recently so um when it came to growing up in my household it seemed like mom and dad had given up on trying to say no <laughs> Uh, in hindsight I feel as though I lived in Willy Wonka's candy factory (laughs) Uh, I remember many a Saturday watching TV in my Thundercat sleeping bag
and uh, with the box of cinnamon toast crunch at my side, <laughs> I'd eat handfuls of the stuff and there'd be copious amounts of sugar and cinnamon glistening off the sleeping bag like glitter left over from Christmas. <laughs> and somewhere in my sister's house, I still have that sleeping bag. I should see what it fetches on eBay. Uh, <laughs> it's a wonder I still have any of my own teeth. Um, another of my favorites was peanut butter cap and crunch. Now, as Tapia tested and my husband Billy, that sh- sh- cereal was so sugary it would cut the roof of your mouth unless you <laughs> soaked it in milk long enough. But who wants to wait? Um, Dad loved peanut butter toast, and his coffee was like fudge. He would put plenty of sugar and creamer in it, and his favorite thing to do, and I would sneak some of it, is he would fold his peanut butter toast and dip it in the coffee like it was a donut. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So after breakfast was done and you'd watched your shows, Paul, what toys would you have played with afterwards? Did you have favorite games you'd play with your friends? Um, Well, I said a lot of them were the acting acting ones. Uh, We did have a one stage when my brother was quite little. We had like a, a little TARDIS playhouse. But literally, you, it, it was probably smaller on the inside. Than that. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, but it, it, I'm sure it helped with, yeah, I'm sure it helped with when we were playing the Doctor Who games. At least we had a TARDIS, but it uh, didn't go very far. But we just had to pretend it did. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that was, I can't see them playing anything other than Doctor Who. We did used to play sort of different uh, sort of ver- versions of, of hide and seek or uh, th- those sorts of games. That was when we were sort of uh, out and about with the. Because when I was a kid, uh, there were lots of kids my age in our village, and it was relatively safe. Uh, um, I, and I remember, you know, we were all over the village and in different people's garden. I, you know, luckily that there were quite a few kids, so we had quite a few gardens we could play in. And. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's it was quite different by the time my brother grew up. Um, most most of that era of kids had moved, had, had grown up, and there were very few children. And, uh, and I, he had quite the opposite experience. But I was definitely quite lucky. Hmm. And Sue, what kind of toys were uh, what? Sorry, I'm missing my place here. Um, Sue, what sorts of toys were your and your granddaughter's favorites? Well, the girls played with whatever was handy, except, of course, their bananas without their pajamas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but they didn't have they really didn't have favorite favorite toys. Their parents did not keep track of their toys like my my mother did when you know when we go someplace and. You'd take a doll or, or a truck or something with you to to somebody else's house. Mother always made sure that that came home with you. Um, and they, and when they played over at your house, she always made sure they got their things back home too. But and all the mothers did that. Um, I also grew up in a in a uh, I guess you would call it a small village. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, there was 800 people in town when I lived there. Um, and we played all over the place. Uh, there were a number of kids on my block and we would hook up with them and then we'd hook up with their friends and, you know, in the block just behind us. And then we would go over to the river and then, <laughs> and then we'd head up across the river and then we'd head up the hill and, um, you didn't go with the foothills of the Rockies. So you didn't go <laughs> home until the streetlights came on. Yeah, uh, or or mom started yelling, and, and <laughs> you could find you would find that out if if she needed you. You you were there. Were it, it, like I said, there were eight hundred people there, and I think they didn't count us children in that number. Um, there were eight hundred people watching us. <laughs> You, you really, if you if you did something wrong, you were in trouble when you got home. 
Uh, <laughs> because whatever you did, even if you were as far away as you could get, it it was back home with mom as soon as you, you know, or mom and dad sometimes. <laughs> 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 It was much so better. We never really got away with anything, but we played outdoors. We played with nature. We we played by by and in the river. Uh, not too much in the river because it was it ran pretty fast <laughs> through our town. But um, and there was a and there was an irrigation ditch that they ran in front of, uh, through part of the town during the summer that came from the river, and we oftentimes played there in and out of that. <laughs> <laughs> we we were frequently all wet uh, <laughs> as as kids, but and we didn't worry about that. We would you know dry off and go somewhere else and do something else. Uh, about the only place we really didn't go to was the cemetery, hmm. which I now find to be a really nice place. It's, it's one of the <laughs> quietest places I, in town. <laughs> I, I live next to a church. Well, my, my parents live next to a churchyard, but it's not a very big. Mm-hmm. Very big churchyard, so I always kind of think I, I I still like to visit churchyards, but I think that's partly due to growing up next to one. Uh, yeah, well, when I was when I was in high school, I used to walk through um, at the couple of graveyards here in town, and uh, and since I was attempting to be a writer at the time, I would I would read the the. Uh, Gravestones looking for for character names because that was the hardest thing about writing is is giving somebody an, a a name or an appropriate name mm-hmm. and you never I never wanted to use anybody that I knew the name of anybody I knew mm-hmm. you know so um, some of the old names that were in yeah. the mm-hmm. in the graveyards were kind of interesting yeah. and made great names. So many of the toys that I played with as a child were construction or building related. In hindsight, I realize now that with my father having build, been a building contractor, it might have been deliberate. <laughs> um, I think secretly, since he never finished his education, he hoped I might become an architect or an engineer. Hmm. I first remember Lincoln Logs, and I had some Lego, but not many. Parents hated stepping on them. There's a, a lady at work who's quite petite, and this bigger guy likes to tease her. And I said to him, be careful, even Legos hurt when you step on them. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> see, I had some sort of plastic block toys. I can't remember what they were called, but some of you 80s kids might know. They, were, they looked similar to Legos, but they were shallower and hollow. And they had sort of a plastic cog in them that you could turn with a screwdriver that came with it, a plastic screwdriver, so you could lock your pieces into place. I once Mm. made a mock-up of a computer and took that to school, and my teachers were wowed. Um, My absolute favorite toys to play with as a kid were called Constructs. And that's spelled C-O-N-S-T-R-U-X, like X-ray. Now, these were modeled after industrial construction, like beams and bolts, and they had expansion packs for your kits when you bought all of your supplies, and um, they came with motorized parts and glow-in-the-dark pieces, Toppy. (laughs) And, uh, you know, in the -the glow-in-the-dark category, they had spaced themed editions so of course a young kid that wants to be an astronaut is going to be all over those toys mm-hmm. so sounds interesting yeah i've got some more bits and pieces to read i've been mm-hmm. i've been posting some of those links um into the chat room but i've got an update on um, the chat from the chat room if you'd like to hear certainly you know, what people have been saying um george says i used to cry when my older sisters gave me a bowl of oatmeal, mm-hmm. they would put peaches or things in it to keep me from crying. I was such a baby. Um, <laughs> and Toppy, la- Toppy laughs at that. Toppy says, I can't remember if it was Saturday morning or Sunday mornings, but my grandmother would fix us all waffles and we would eat them with butter and syrup. Ooh. And um, Toppy responds to your what, what you were saying, DJ, about the Thundercat sleeping bag. Mm-hmm. He thinks that sounds cute. Um 
Crone likes the sound of the uh, butter and syrup for the waffles. Um, uh, Toppy also mentions that he adored peanut butter Captain Crunch. Um, <laughs> we've, I'm not, no, there's no surprise because I've heard Toppy discussing peanut butter with Brenda on Lotzel. So, uh, <laughs> um, that, that's a, I think that's probably uh, the unofficial peanut butter fan club on Lotzel. But, peanut butter really is um, legalized crack. <laughs> is, is, is that it? My my uh, daughter really likes uh, peanut butter and peanut butter flavored things like I cereals. Think, yeah. and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think it's a lot more popular over over with you than it is over here. I mean, it's still available here, but um, it's it's not as I, I was surprised when I was over in the states last how many of the the chocolate bars have pe- are, so, are sort of related to peanuts in some way. Um, <laughs> well, we, we do have a few chocolate bars that do have peanuts in, but, but, but literally there were, I don't know, I was finding, you know, every other bar was peanut related. So, <laughs> any, any, anyway, we've still got more to come here, so I shall, I shall crack on. Um, so uh, Toppy says, as an adult, I use that word loosely, I do enjoy toast with peanut butter. Um <laughs> Toppy also responds to what I was saying about playing in the garden. Uh, he said he can picture Paul and the kids tramping all over the flowers. I, we didn't do that. No, we didn't do that. No. Oh um, no, that was that would that would bring the whole village down on you. You start walking on people's flowers. I, I know it's not so much for Saturday thing, but I do remember that uh, we we there was a difference back in the in the day. There was a difference between Saturday and Sunday in the on Saturdays. We were allowed to play on the streets because it was that quiet. Um, but on Sundays, we were strictly you're play, playing in the gardens, um, and the only time you were allowed on the street was if you were crossing to, to your friend's house. Back then, you weren't allowed, to play. Mm. and also you had to play a lot quieter on a Sunday in the garden. So. Wow. Um, Toppy says, um, "Okay, okay, okay. Here's my favourite toys back in the day." Uh, I would ride my hippity hop all around the yard, <laughs> bouncing around. This is just last week, I think he means. Right. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, <laughs> no. He says bouncing around. And with me, I had some sort of blo- um, some sort of blow toy that would put soap bubbles in. The toy didn't blow bubbles, but rather would leave a stream of soap foam. So there I would be hippity hopping around, leaving trails of soap foam. <laughs> I was a strange child. Um, <laughs> I can picture that. Jo- George says, sounds like fun to me, Toppy Smelly. Uh, they, they're all laughing. Um, it was all about the Tonka t- truck for me, says George. Um, and Toppy says, I had Tinker toys. And they all get very excited when they mention the glow-in-the-dark toys as well. So. Yeah. That, that brings us up to date. I put And I put some links to... Uh, the ones that were in the, the show notes. Excellent. Uh, so, if anyone Paul, wants to click on those, Paul, from what you and I both know of Toppy, would it be any surprise to you to learn that he had one of those hats with the propellers? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think Toppy would have tinkered with it so much that it would actually have worked. <laughs> and he would be flying out of the hollow. Right. Down on. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. And if you could let our listeners know where we could find you. Um, Twitter, I, I am Shy Yeti. I have my own blog, shyeti.com. Uh, podcast wise, uh, I'm on the, the Shy Life podcast, which is on iTunes and Acast and Podbean and SoundCloud. And I do have a, a, a Facebook sort of sort of writers group, a sort of uh, news sort of page as well. So uh, yeah, those are the main places. Oh, I have a YouTube channel as well, Mr. Shy Yeti. Mm -hmm. And he's been uh, having his episodes from his 90s independent show on their um, Sutton Park. That's right, yeah. And (laughs) Me me looking very young. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Paul has recently celebrated his 70th episode, and the 100th will be just around the corner as it goes. As I've said to a few folks... Um, Paul here is the Tasmanian devil of Pride 48. (laughs) (laughs) We're working on a special project. The next recorded episode is going to be out in just over two weeks. We are going to be reviewing a documentary that we're watching with Brenda. So uh, Sue and I are preparing for that. Thank you for having me. (laughs) 
Thank you for listening to The Faraway Nearby. You can visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com. Find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. And visit our companion blog on Tumblr. Our show is available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Radio. Send us an email at tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Text or leave a message at 720-230-6919. This show is a member of the Pride 48 Network. Find other shows at pride48.com. 